everyone and welcome to Artists in Conversation, brought to you by the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. I'm your host, Patti Smith. For those of you who may not be familiar with Brandywine Workshop and Archives, let me give you a little background. BWA has been a vital, diversity-driven, nonprofit cultural institution for 50 years. It is located in Philadelphia. Its mission is to produce and share art in order to inspire and build bridges among global communities. BWA has several ongoing projects. It funds short-term residencies for artists to produce limited edition original prints. It works to bring the art of diverse cultures to institutions and communities through exhibitions and by establishing satellite exhibitions and collections across the country. BWA also offers internships to Philadelphia high school and undergraduate college students who are majoring in art or a related field. And its latest project called Artura is a free interactive digital archive of culturally diverse art that gives educators and students access to information and images representing contemporary cultures and traditions from around the globe. You can access this unique website by registering at artura.org. And you can find more information about Brandywine at their website, brandywineworkshopandarchives.org. As a part of the residency program, Brandywine invites artists to participate in artist conversation. Today's guest is poet, painter, and sculptor, Kebedech Teklaab. She is an artist in residence in the spring of this year. Tekla Ab has had solo exhibitions and group exhibitions in such venues as the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, the Holocaust Museum in Chicago, Illinois, Maritime Museum in Savannah, Georgia, Orlando Museum of Art in Florida, Columbia University, and in an international exhibit in Greece. Her work is currently being shown at the American University Museum at the Katzen Art Center in Washington, DC, which we will discuss later in the program. Her commissioned and collected works are on permanent display at several institutions, among them the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, the Navy Memorial Archive in Washington, DC, the American Embassy in Addis Ababa, I hope I said that correctly, Ethiopia, and the Ethiopian Embassy in Washington, DC. Kebedech Tekliab was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. As a teenager, she was involved in a student movement protesting the military junta that brutally ruled the country. Because of her involvement, still a teenager, she was forced to leave her birthplace and cross the Ethiopian border's harsh terrain to join the UNHCR. However, she was ambushed by the Somali soldiers and was detained in Somalia for 10 years. After her repatriation, she joined her family in Washington, DC and enrolled at Howard University as an undergraduate student. She earned both her BFA and MFA from Howard University. She is currently an associate professor at the City University of New York, CUNY Queensboro Community College. Welcome, Kebedech, to Artists in Conversation. And congratulations on your exhibition at the American University Museum, exhibition called Blue and Gray, This Era of Exile. There are some prints from your residency included in the show. Can you fill us in on the format and theme of the exhibition? Uh, thank you, Patty, for uh, the wonderful introduction. Uh, before I get to your question, uh, I would like to thank Randy Wine for accepting my uh, proposal and application uh, to be part of the residency program. Um, I heard about uh, Brandywine uh, from uh, my mentor, Sam Gilliam, mm -hmm. and he used to talk about uh, this place highly uh, and passionately. So he insisted that I should apply. I applied and uh, I got the residency. 
Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't see what we have produced in here because uh, we lost him uh, last year. So coming to your question, the uh, uh, exhibits at um, American uh, University uh, included uh, some of the prints from uh, Brandywine. Uh, to be exact, we have two prints and also one installation made out of prints that I put together uh, instantly uh, once I, you know, I got there. Uh, the show uh, in general has uh, three different parts or uh, it aims to address uh, at least three things. Uh, number one, uh, this is a show uh, that anticipates or um, aspired uh, to incorporate social issues uh, through the practice of art and poetry. Number two, uh, it tried to combine uh, uh, two different art, art forms again, uh, which is um, visual art and, and, and poetry. It also has the collaborative aspect of it, specifically uh, when it comes to uh, poetry. Uh, it also uh, deals uh, with translation. So I had to translate uh, all uh, the poems submitted to, uh, to the show. Uh, so let's begin with uh, my collaborator, uh, E. Ethelbert Miller. Uh, some of you who, do, who don't know who Ethelbert Miller is, uh, he is a wonderful humanitarian and activist uh, through literary work that he had done uh, over times uh, and years. Uh, he explored uh, human condition uh, both globally and also uh, here in America. Uh, that part was appealing to me and uh, I proposed to collaborate with him. Previously, uh, we had collaborated on a on a show. Uh, the name of the show was uh, Handprint uh, Identity. So uh, this time we are collaborating, uh, you know, together uh, again. And uh, our curator is uh, a very flexible uh, poet, uh, a writer, a professor, uh, Dr. David Keplinger. Uh, he teaches uh, uh, translation at American University. Uh, it, it was very interesting to see the way he curated the show. And uh, this is a person who is flexible enough uh, to cross over uh, the other dimension of uh, art, which is uh, visual art. And he had written uh, very interesting, powerful uh, poems about uh, prominent master uh, artist's work previously. So uh, the show, the other aspect of uh, the show, which is uh, dealing with the societal uh, issue, uh, dealt pretty much specifically with the issue of displacement. So displacement, uh, both globally and also locally. Uh, my collaborator, uh, uh, E. Ethelbert Miller, talked brilliantly about displacement here, you know, at home, uh, whether it is through uh, gentrification, homelessness, uh, because of the economic disparity in the society, etc. Uh, we also dealt with the uh, general uh, crisis, the human crisis, that includes the Mediterranean crisis, uh, and also uh, the displacement of people, uh, you know, because of uh, social unrest, uh, natural calamities and political situations, uh, you know, in their own uh, countries and homes. So uh, coming to uh, Brandywine, uh, once my proposal was uh, accepted, uh, we did several discussions with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Brandywine people uh, who are really knowledgeable, uh, you know, in this specific field. Uh, and uh, to integrate the two dimensional works that we're going to print in here uh, became important, uh, you know, for me because uh, I wanted to show 
a variety of um, uh, processes uh, in terms of art making. Uh, one of the things that I had been exploring for a long, long time is uh, to be able to merge uh, differences uh, between uh, painting and sculpture. And that led me with the exploration of different materials than the traditional mediums that we usually use. I just wanted to interrupt for just a second to show our audience the catalog of this exhibition at American University uh, called Blue and Gray, This Era of Exile. Um, and um, I just wanted to say that that catalog is available to read online, which has um, beautiful illustrations of Kebedesh's images and several essays offering insight into the artist and the poet's work. Um, but yes, let's go on to um, your work with Brandywine and take a look at the Lost Words series that you produced with Alex Nutini uh, during your residency. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it began with conversation and brainstorming. Uh, the first presentation that uh, I did was uh, online with the Brandywine uh, group. And I found um, uh, Alexis to be extremely flexible. And uh, we had so much in common in terms of approach, which is based on improvisation. It wouldn't have happened if uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, uh, available uh, to, to me or to both of us. So these are a few images uh, taken uh, at Alexis, uh, you know, studio. Uh, here we are with Alan Edmonds, uh, the founder of this institution, uh, that um, uh, uh, my mentor spoke, you know, uh, highly. Uh, so uh, texture was one of the things that we wanted to explore. This is the original uh, image um, I gave to Alexis to uh, work or to consider. Uh, I gave him more than three different, uh, you know, options. And finally, we settled with this one. Uh, we thought this is uh, feasible in terms of uh, what we can do with wood cutting. So we wanted to do it on wood cut um, and, and instead of, you know, uh, other, um, uh, you know, modalities that could uh, be uh, part of this tradition. Uh, so this is a small segment of a big uh, installation that um, uh, covers, you know, the wall and of, all the way to the floor. And uh, I don't know if the audience could see uh, very well the texture uh, in here, which is uh, wood. So the lost words uh, became uh, meaningful. Maybe we can uh, discuss it, you know, uh, at other times. So, uh, this was uh, the image that we uh, uh, started uh, working on and we produced so much. Uh, so uh, the process uh, uh, color wise, uh, you know, covered um, a whole range of uh, the palette. Uh, you, you can say there are warm colors and there are also muted colors, but the end product, the goal, uh, the specific selection for the show was going to be uh, uh, colors that are pretty much desaturated, uh, earthy, uh, and toned down. Uh, that's because of the theme of the uh, uh, show that we try to explore. And this is uh, one of the finished uh, woodcut pieces uh, that Alexis uh, you know, worked in the studio and uh, beautifully, uh, you know, created. And this is also um, another one uh, all from those uh, series. And um, this is, uh, you know, a, a short uh, of the one part of the gallery. So, uh, the second piece from, from the last uh, is uh, the print uh, that you just saw. And the last one from this uh, angle is also uh, the Brandwine uh, print that uh, 
we incorporated uh, in the show. Uh, so uh, if you see my cursor, uh, this is uh, a big installation. You might understand the scale of it by comparing uh, to uh, the other displays uh, on the closest wall uh, that we have in here. So this is pretty much big. And I improvised uh, completely on the spot. Uh, and uh, I did it, uh, you know, while we were uh, installing. So we can uh, maybe have a different discussion about the process of putting it together. Uh, so uh, this is the detail of uh, that work. Um, you know, multi-layered, uh, there are folding and unfolding spaces, uh, like, you know, as you see it, and it's pretty much textural and uh, earthy. So uh, this is the last piece, uh, you know, from uh, the brand wine print. What led you, Kabidesh, to the folding back of uh, several of your works, not just the prints, um, also some of your they're not your your works are not quite sculpture they're not quite prints or painting you've used the three three dimensional aspect of it to um really make it very compelling can you talk a little bit about your decision about mm -hmm. folding back the paint the uh materials okay um uh, i started exploring uh this technique maybe 20 years ago um to be exact, uh, it was the, the, the first mesh pieces that uh, uh, I worked was in 2002 and 2003. Then in 2008, uh, it was exhibited at the uh, gallery of Howard University uh, for the uh, 80th year of uh, you know, the alumni show. So I was exploring uh, a different material because uh, I wanted to be in between, uh, in between uh, what is sculpture and what is uh, uh, painting. The 2D uh, and the 3D merging uh, required a special uh, material, uh, which is translucent or transparent. And I ended up uh, working with um, materials that are not meant to be for art, but for uh, building, you know, materials. So I explored um, uh, those materials such as mesh, and uh, I wanted to get uh, uh, the space delineation, uh, you know, explored fully. Uh, I really anticipated, uh, you know, to, to have layers of forms uh, that create their own interiors and exteriors with the same material, one without blocking uh, the other. So initially that's uh, how I started, basically exploration of space uh, led me to uh, that kind of manipulation. Uh, with the Brandywine uh, piece, uh, those prints, they are opaque, uh, but I wanted also uh, to give them the same kind of uh, energy in terms of space uh, by folding, uh, you know, uh, some of the layers uh, directed, uh, you know, differently from uh, the base. Uh, you know, colors and uh, uh, surface that, uh, you know, I had. Uh, so it is the same kind of exploration of space, uh, making it um, in terms of interior and exterior relationship a little bit exciting. Uh, so what I could do with the mesh material on the other uh, pieces uh, uh, when it comes to the print's uh, opaqueness, uh, color actually played that role uh, for me. So I was pretty much selective in terms of what color to put on the background and what color to put uh, on the foreground. Thank you. Um, Kabadesh, the lang language in general plays an important part in your visual work and it plays an important part, of course, for the poets also included in the show. Can you share your um, your views, your thoughts on language and how it relates to identity for those settling in a country that is not their own? 
Um, yes, language is uh, uh, very important uh, to, to anyone in general. And uh, for this show uh, that deals with displacement, uh, definitely was uh, very um, important to incorporate the essence of uh, language relating to identity. So when people, uh, you know, uh, leave their own home uh, and uh, become, um, you know, immigrants uh, and uh, going somewhere, uh, the loss begins uh, uh, the minute they cross, uh, you know, a, a foreign land. So uh, uh, being misunderstood and um, misunderstanding, uh, you know, the situation because of uh, the uh, language barrier uh, is not something that we can uh, take, uh, you know, the situation lightly because it's, it, it, it changes uh, the whole personality of uh, uh, that entity who is experiencing this uh, disorientation uh, that comes through uh, lack of communication. So uh, as a symbol of uh, uh, displacement, uh, I wanted to use um, uh, uh, scripts. So those scripts, uh, when I use them for this specific, uh, specific work, um, I, I didn't mean to make them meaningful uh, because uh, I did not find the purpose of writing meaningfully on the artworks themselves, uh, but I wanted to use them uh, uh, as textures, as elements, and um, as a metaphor uh, also, that ambiguity of not being able, um, you know, to communicate with a foreign uh, language uh, and to lose one's identity is going to be reflected on the surface as well uh, with the merging of two scripts uh, in this case, uh, the Amharic alphabet, which is the Ethiopian alphabet, and also the the, the English, uh, you know, alphabet together. So they are totally, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote meaningless in this sense. But they make sense, uh, or I, I hope they make sense uh, in terms of reading them as uh, one feels texture in music or one, you know, feels texture and in any other uh, surface. Uh, so uh, I think that that's about it in terms of using my scripts uh, on the artworks. Thank you. Uh, the title of the exhibition is Blue and Gray, the Era of Exile. Can you speak about what the colors mean um, blue and gray, what do they mean to you and how do they relate to the migration of refugees? I was thinking in terms of uh, the process of migrating, uh, you know, from one place to the other and uh, migrating in a desperate situation. So most of the people who leave uh, the, the, their places uh, because of the social conditions that we talked earlier, uh, the number one, most of them don't don't be prepared, uh, and uh, the means of uh, uh, movement is going to be either through land or uh, through water. Uh, so, you know, air is not going to be uh, you know considered in this situation. So that created this uh, larger color symbolism in me, uh, which is uh, the uh, stereotypical blue for for water or uh, gray for uh, you know uh, earth uh, in general. Uh, but um, as an artist, uh, also you 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 want to you, you want to expand, uh, you know, on it. You don't want to be uh, monochromatic uh, completely. But the dominant sensation of uh, that palette, uh, uh, I, I wanted it to be uh, blue based and uh, desaturated gray uh, based in color. So uh, uh, pretty much metaphorically, um, you know. Uh, uh, it, it made sense uh, for, for my 
thinking, you know, at that time. Yeah. Great, thank you. There are several poems in the exhibition mounted on the wall, I understand. Uh, would you be kind enough to share some of those with us? Okay. Uh, there are um, two recordings and uh, the third one is a translation. Uh, so I'm going to skip the translation. And I would like to uh, begin with uh, Etalbert's uh, um, uh, recital uh, of his poem. I hope, if you don't hear it very well, please let me know. The blue years. And then we walked out into the rain as if we were walking to the sea. So many weeping because of dangerous memories. Life is a flood of tears. We were born somewhere between heartbreak and desire, the place we fled before the cry. The blue years when we had no food or water. The blue years when many were strangled by the air. So much thirst. Too much blueness on our tongues. Okay, so uh, uh, this poem uh, inspired two things uh, on my own response. Uh, number one, uh, I responded through uh, another poem. And uh, number two, I created um, an installation uh, you know, inspired by this um, um, uh, poem. So uh, I'm going to skip the translation and go to my own poem uh, in English. Usually I write in Amharic, uh, not usually, mostly, mm -hmm. uh, but from time to time, you know, something inspires me to, to write in English, so. Blindfold for the refugees. Covered with gray dust, I fall into the deep blue ashes. My eyes are smeared with navy coal, blindfolded by grief. I wrap my indigo dyed hair with a piece of cloth cut from the garment of the Tuareg, the blue people. I step on the land of the Bedouin, wrinkles of time on it, gray cracks of the earth under my bare feet, inked with dark maroon, encrypt my future. I trace the fault lines like braille, toasted lavash brushes my nose, a cape crow crosses my face. I cross the land on my way to the sea, to plead with the gods of the Mediterranean, I stand in front of the angry sea before I step on the boat, before it capsizes, I brush off the last sand from my sore feet. I inhale the cerulean sledge-like air, the sea floor flat under my head. Inward, I see a sledge of sapphire sips into my bone marrow. Into the stream of my blood that turned cobalt, since the village behind me flattened into ashes, the people into crystal salt, like Lot's wife, for re-examining just once. Kabadech Takla. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So can you share with us um, some of your life experience and the work that has led to the work that you're doing now? I think let's talk about the uh, immediate past, um, okay. which is uh, 2017. Um, the, this is the year that uh, I began uh, exploring uh, specifically uh, the Mediterranean refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, that that year uh, was uh, you know the peak of the refugee crisis, but it began way way you know before uh, 2017. Uh, so uh, there were um, discussions you know all around me, uh, and, and sometimes uh, they come as criticism, 
uh, in terms of uh, African refugees and why uh, they take risks, uh, you know, trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to go to Europe instead of staying, you know, in their own continent uh, in Africa, because uh, there are uh, refugee settlement programs uh, in Africa known, specifically, uh, uh, you know, in Uganda. Uh, there are many of them, uh, but I decided to visit two, the most prominent ones. Uh, I did that because uh, I wanted to interview uh, the people who live in those uh, settlement programs uh, to understand, you know, the situation closely. I went to um, a place called uh, Naki Valley, uh, which uh, housed, you know, refugees from uh, Central Africa, from at least five different, uh, you know, countries. Uh, and also I went to uh, Bidi Bidi, one of uh, the largest refugee camps uh, in the world. Uh, they say at that time, uh, you know, there were uh, 270,000 uh, uh, refugees only from South Sudan. Uh, so uh, uh, I learned, uh, you know, that the situation was not uh, conducive as the uh, government, you know, says, uh, you know, it is, I mean, to live in that camp because so many uh, situations were not, um, uh, you know, correctly handled. Uh, there, there was uh, food scarcity, there was uh, this anxiety of being in the camp indefinitely in most cases. Uh, I, I have seen people, um, you know, interviewed people who, who were in that camp for more than 12 years. And I even heard there was one guy uh, that I couldn't interview that lasted for 27 years and is still going on. So uh, this is the situation and partly it answered my uh, question. Coming back, uh, I focused totally on uh, the Mediterranean uh, crisis, and I made uh, several, uh, you know, works based on that. And the first group of works were exhibited at uh, uh, in Savannah, uh, the uh, Maritime uh, Museum, the, which was uh, the international show uh, during that time. So uh, taking you a, a little bit further, um, you know, uh, uh, just a brief biography of me was read in the beginning. I was part of the student movement, uh, you know, uh, uh, growing up uh, during the uh, revolution in, in Ethiopia. And uh, because uh, myself and uh, uh, my uh, uh, associate or group of students who were involved in the political activism uh, were black uh, uh, listed and uh, we had to leave uh, the country and so many uh, uh, people died uh, because of their participation, uh, others uh, uh, left the country and I was one of them. So uh, when I was um, imprisoned, uh, you know, in Somalia for, for 10 years, um, you can anticipate all kinds of uh, hard situations. Uh, it, it was very difficult to imagine a place uh, with no adequate food, um, no uh, treatment uh, for the most part, uh, in a place which is uh, endemic for malaria, schistosomia, uh, schistosomiasis, and, and, and so many other, um, you know, diseases that come uh, because of lack of uh, nutrition, not to even consider the psychological impact of uh, being imprisoned for a long time. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it was uh, in this place that uh, I learned a lot about humanity mainly. So uh, I found people who were who completely uh, selfless and I found also uh, people who are extremely uh, uh, cruel. And uh, we had uh, an underground, uh, uh, you know, educational system that the prisoners created and uh, everybody, uh, uh, you know, taught uh, another fellow. Uh, so 
uh, it was a microcosm of uh, all kinds of professions, you know, coming together in one camp. Uh, there were doctors, uh, medical doctors, uh, uh, PhDs, etc. So uh, that 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 helped and uh, that sustained, uh, you know, us. By the time we were released, there was no one uh, who was not able to read and write, uh, even the elderly people. Uh, so um, there were also uh, uh, very unique situations from time to time that occur. Uh, you know, those, those situations are, for instance, finding books uh, smuggled, uh, you know, from uh, outside. And uh, I read Alex Halley's uh, roots, uh, you know, in that camp. Uh, I read Primo uh, Lebes' uh, Survival in Auschwitz and uh, Charles Dickens, uh, uh, you know, The Tale of Two Cities, uh, you name it. So that shaped uh, my, my thinking uh, uh, peculiarly uh, to, to be able to see the connection of those uh, situations uh, beyond uh, my own experience. So that, that continued. Uh, and uh, when I eventually uh, joined Howard uh, University, uh, I decided and started, uh, you know, taking classes. I decided to focus uh, or dedicate my work to uh, uh, global uh, humanitarian uh, situations. Uh, so these are some of the earliest works uh, that I did uh, in 1993. 1993, I was uh, still a graduate uh, student uh, at Howard University. So most of the works that you're going to see are from that period. So uh, I think in general, this is a background uh, uh, of me. Uh, you know, focusing on issues uh, like this. Um, but as an artist, I, I also like other things. I like music. I like, uh, you know, literature. Um, I like drama. And there are works that are influenced uh, by, by those also. But thematically, these are, uh, you know, the works that I want to talk about today. Yes. Okay. You're, you're currently on the faculty at CUNY uh, Queensboro and have taught at other institutions, including Howard University. Can you share with us how your life experience and how your experience as an artist, poet has influenced your teaching? Wow, interesting question. Um, uh, Teaching is uh, in some ways, um, you know, sharing one's uh, experience. Uh, the, you, you are a professor, you, you know, yourself, uh, the, you, you know how it is. So uh, whether uh, we are deliberate about it or, or not, uh, our experience is going to show through. Uh, but in terms of um, uh, interacting with the students, uh, 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 I taught graduate level courses when I was at Howard and um, the level of communication that uh, I had or the engagement was slightly different. So this is a venue where uh, graduate students take you to their own, uh, uh, you know, things to their own exploration and you read their thesis, you guide them through uh, their artwork, you get involved and uh, you learn uh, also by, by, by doing that. And um, you also deliver, uh, you know, to them with a different, uh, you know, uh, degree of uh, intensity. And um, teaching at community level, uh, called, I mean, community college uh, level also has uh, its own beautiful things. And it, this is a time that you can impact uh, the majority of the people that need, uh, you know, uh, real education. So uh, it is satisfying. Uh, you might not uh, be able to see, uh, you know, the result right away when it comes to uh, uh, undergraduate uh, teaching. Uh, 
but it is a rewarding experience. And uh, people, uh, you know, your students uh, learn about you more than uh, you know. Uh, and uh, sometimes they can create parallels of their own uh, journey, you know, in life, uh, with your life. Uh, so I find students from time to time uh, telling me, uh, you know, uh, uh, that they learned about me or they Googled and they get closer a little bit uh, in terms of uh, sharing, you know, what they have. Uh, the other is academic and uh, it's common to everyone. Yes. And how about the general public? Have you had any response from uh, the general public about your uh, recent exhibition or some of your poetry? Uh, it is hard to tell and it's hard to gauge, but uh, uh, I can confidently say that, uh, I don't know, maybe Ethelbert is here in the audience. Uh, we, we had uh, quite, um, uh, you know, considerable, um, you know, audience. So, uh, the room was packed and we also had uh, a gallery talk uh, and, uh, you know, the room designated uh, for us was, was packed and people uh, appear to be very uh, positive about it and uh, enthusiastic about it. But it, it's hard to know, uh, I mean, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to go to the chat room now and I see that there are a couple of other um, comments mostly uh, from Napoleon Jones Henderson, who we interviewed a little while ago. Um, he has said, hello, my sister Kebedech. It's wonderful joining you this evening. Would there be any reference by your exhibition title, Blue and Gray, to associations of mood or feeling often associated with the colors of blue and gray? Your reference to music is something very present in the prints and work using building material. Um, and I think he might be re referencing, you know, we, we use the word, we're blue, and we have, of course, a whole music genre of the blues. Um, and you, you spoke a little bit before about, um, when we met before, about how blue isn't really what is used in Ethiopia to describe a kind of sad mood. Maybe you could um, elaborate on that a little bit for uh, Napoleon. Um, uh, hello, Napoleon. It's, it's really good to hear from you. Um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, blueness, uh, uh, Ethelbert actually talked, uh, I mean, in detail uh, about the translation uh, and the implementation of blue and in the uh, African-American culture. So when I tried to um, uh, translate, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, one of his uh, poems, The Blue Years, uh, I was having, um, uh, I wouldn't call it difficulty, but, um, uh, you know, a forked path to, to, to choose one over the other. Um, yes, it's true, there is no uh, a word equivalent to the essence of blue, uh, the same way the African-American, uh, you know, culture describes it and uh, in, in, in embraced it. Um, maybe the, the essence of blueness in the African American culture uh, might be paralleled with the word black, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, Ethiopia. So, uh, Ethelbert and I had a, a discussion about it, and I uh, we decided to use the word blue exactly in the same way, uh, you know, uh, the American culture, uh, you know, uses it. Uh, so to, to do that, I had to coin uh, two different words. So uh, in a way, uh, it became an, an you know, intellectual uh, inquiry and investigation to be able to coin the, that term uh, you know, for the Ethiopian readers. Uh, so uh, to uh, you know, answer your question, Napoleon, yes, uh, it uh, relates to uh, a mood. It, it, it relates to uh, a situation, uh, 
uh, and both colors, uh, both the, the blue shade and the gray shade uh, are a little bit melancholic uh, in, in some ways. Uh, yes, I agree. We have another question about um, the color blue and colors blue and gray from Edward Minor. Um, and she, Edward says, um, how do you experience blue and gray in the context of your translation work? Um, yes, uh, that, that, that's the thing that I was uh, trying to, to, to touch. Uh, the gray uh, in translation uh, was not difficult because uh, we have the same terminology used for uh, the same kind of you know, shade of color. Uh, it was the blue, which, uh, which was uh, slightly foreign for uh, Ethiopian readers and for Ethiopian people. Uh, but I, as I mentioned, uh, I ended up putting two words together so that uh, people who read the Amharic poetry could understand that term through the context of uh, the, the, you know, the whole poem. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a comment here from Teresa uh, Bush, and it says, I have never forgotten the brief period when we shared an office at HU. You were always very kind, thoughtful, and most pleasant. I remember your excellent practice as well. Very happy to hear from you, and now to take a look at your work. Many thanks to the Brandywine Workshop for making it possible. So just a nice comment there. I have another question from Napoleon. Uh, he says, Teshom, Gabriel, and I had quite a bit of discussion uh, through the 1990s about the subject of nomadship and movement from place to place as a way of life, as opposed to being an exile, an, uh, in exile. How might you express, if any, the relationship between being a nomad as related to being in exile. Oh, um, yes, Tashuma Gabriel was a wonderful filmmaker. Uh, I, I didn't know you know each other, uh, mm -hmm. but yes, um, the culture of, of uh, you know moving from one place to uh, the other is throughout uh, Africa. I mean, mo most people do have a, a, a lifestyle that forces them uh, to go from one place to the other, uh, especially the cattle men, uh, you know, do, do that. Uh, but um, it's different from, uh, you know, migrating to a different place. Uh, they're always, uh, you know, moving um, within the confinement of their own place, their own territory, and they feel at home. Uh, so uh, it is uh, a different, uh, you know, situation. Uh, being uh, nomadic as a lifestyle uh, is completely uh, different from leaving one's place uh, because of danger and um, trying to adapt, you know, to a different place, which is completely foreign. Okay, and um, I have a, one other question from Josette Bailey, one of our board members. What was the most unusual question you received during the artist talk at the Kadzen Center about your work uh, from an audience member? I oh. think you're giving a talk, I believe, this coming week, um, but maybe at the uh, opening of the show, did you have any interesting questions? Uh, we we had also a gallery talk on the 24th, uh, uh, Albert, myself, and uh, uh, David Keplinger. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the questions at that time were really, really brilliant, and uh, they uh, made, the questions made the discussion pretty much lively. Uh, so, uh, no surprises or uh, you know, a question that really, uh, I mean, uh, changed um, the way I was thinking. But uh, during the uh, opening, uh, there were interesting questions. Uh, there is no bad question, by the way, uh, or, um, you know, otherwise, because 
every question that you're not prepared for uh, is going to help you think deeply. So I, the, the most difficult questions are, or were coming from people who are uh, less knowledgeable about art. But as an artist, you are responsible uh, to, uh, to explain it to them, uh, you know, uh, through uh, a means which is accessible. Uh, so that by itself is a, a challenge. Uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, I continue thinking about those questions uh, even uh, way after, you know, the conversation, you know, ended. So uh, that's how I see, you know, questions. So the, they come from different angles. Well, thank you so much uh, for participating in Artisan Conversation, Kebidesh. And thank you to our audience for listening and for sending your questions. Um, be sure to visit the links that um, are put up on the chat right now. And I hope to uh, see people in the future for our next artisan conversation. Thank you, Kabadesh, and good luck with your exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Patty, and thank you, Brandwine. Thank you so much. And the audience, thank you. Mm -hmm.